Yeah, there we go. So welcome, welcome. We're so glad that all of you are here tonight to Getting Free from the Stubborn Darkness of Depression with Dr. Ed Welch. He's a legend at our church, and he probably didn't even know that. So we're glad to get on to meet him in person. Uh, this is our third of uh, four scheduled workshops for 2021, and we are uh, so excited to host tonight's event. It is our hope and prayer that this really helps you grow in your relationship with, your, with Jesus. We don't want anything hindering that, especially something like depression. You can get on the other side of that, and, and, and the church is here to help you, and, and Dr. Welsh is here to help you. So um, I want to open tonight's meeting with prayer, and then I'll, I'll give you some more instructions in just a minute. So let's bow our heads. God, we just lift this meeting up to you in Jesus' name, who are the author and finisher of our faith, who are so incredibly good to us. We worship and praise you for who you are, your sovereignty, your holiness, your love, discipline, your, the joy that you give us, Lord, all, all the qualities of God. We just praise you for all of that. Now, Holy Spirit, we ask you to come alongside of us tonight, speak to every heart, speak to every person, and Lord, set us free from the stubborn darkness of depression. And Lord, we lift that before you, in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. amen. So this workshop is, uh, is brought to you by South Bay Biblical Counseling, um, it's a ministry of South Bay Bible Church, and I've asked Ellen uh, Wilsinski to uh, one of our biblical counselors. She's our lead biblical counselor. She's going to soon be the director of our counseling center. And we'd like um, for her to share a little bit about what is offered and how to connect if you need help. So Ellen, if you'll do that introduction. Oh, my pleasure. So hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you all are able to join us this evening. And we are so blessed to have Dr. Welch here. You know, I've read several of his books. He has required biblical reading for <laughs> biblical counselors, and they are full of truth and godly wisdom and practical solutions and hope. So I'm so glad that you're able to join us today because I believe that you will be blessed by this workshop. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the biblical counseling ministry at South Bay Bible Church and why it might be something that you are needing in this season of your life. Many people seek counseling today, which is understandable. Life situations are often confusing and difficult, and people are looking for guidance and direction and hope. So by now, since we've used the term biblical counseling several uh -huh. times, you're probably wondering what exactly is biblical counseling. Um, and, and what I want to just let you know is that biblical counseling stands on the sufficiency of scripture and the power of the Holy Spirit to bring about the kind of changes in our lives that allows us to lead lives that are just victorious and pleasing to God. Biblical counselors stand on some scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16. We believe all scripture is inspired by God. It is God-breathed, and it is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training up the man of God in righteousness, that he may be equipped for every good work, as well as 2 Peter 1.3 that says, his divine power has already given us everything necessary for life and godliness. So we provide practical biblical counsel for those who seek God's perspective and God's answers to the problems and issues in their lives. Lots of people ask me, um, who comes for biblical counseling? And I would say individuals, families, couples, you do not have to be a member of South Bay Bible Church. Typically, one of the questions I get is, what kind of counseling is available? And I would tell you that we counsel problems you might be facing, marriage and family and parenting issues. We counsel addictions and disorders and grief and anger, anxiety, depression, loneliness, questions about faith and salvation. It's our goal through this ministry to reach out into the community and to practically bring God's wisdom and answers to bear on anything that you might be facing. And since God has already 
provided his answers to everything pertaining to life and godliness. Doesn't it make sense to seek him for the issues that we're finding difficult and confusing? So right now, having an idea of how you can find us biblical counseling, we are, of course, available via the same web address that you found us, sbbcli.org. You can hook up to our website. We also have a presence on Facebook. And of course, if you would like to join us anytime in person, we would be just so blessed to have you come and worship with us, to have you seek us out. And, and that's, um, that's the biblical counseling mission at South Bay Bible Church. So now I think, why don't we get back to Pastor Hawley and Dr. Welch, and I hope that you are richly blessed by being with us this evening. Amen. Thank you, Alan. And before we go any further, um, I want to just remind you, if you're new, we have the notes for tonight's session on the chat. So if you find the chat button on the Zoom area there. Um, there's a PDF and a Word document, so whichever one you're able to open, uh, they're exactly the same, so one of them will do fine, um, and you can get those. We are recording tonight's session, just another disclaimer on that real quick, and um, we'll have a Q&A at the end, so be writing down your questions and being prepared for that. So tonight's uh, speaker is a counselor and a faculty me member at Christian Counseling Educational Foundation, better known around the world as CCEF. He earned a, his PhD in counseling and neuropsychology from the University of Utah, has a Master's of Divinity degree from the Biblical uh, Theology Seminary. He has been counseling for over 30 years and has written many, many books, many of which we've read, uh, I think all of them, uh, on biblical counseling, including When People Are uh, Big and God Is Small, uh, Addictions, A Banquet in the Grave, Blame It on the Brain, I love that book. Uh, depression, uh, which we're studying today, running scared, shame interpreted, side by side, we're walking with others in wisdom, there's so many, so uh, just incredible, uh, anger, patience, peace, all kinds of things. So he and his wife, uh, Sherry, have two married daughters and eight grandchildren. I just got my first grandchild, Dr. Welsh, so I, that's just exciting to me. Uh, so in, in his spare time, he enjoys spending time with his wife and extended family and playing his guitar. So when you visit New York, you'll have to come join our band for a, a, a nice worship segment. So ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Ed Welch. Let's give him a hand tonight, just like we were in person. You can see everybody clapping. <laughs> Dr. Welch, you'll need to unmute yourself. I should probably clarify the last comment you made about guitars. I think I'm probably better at accumulating guitars. <laughs> I, I, I think that if I accumulate them, maybe I'll be able to play them better. It hasn't, hasn't worked yet, but, um, but I'm still hoping. I, I am actually in two minds tonight as, as I'm with you. One is I, I would much rather see you face to face. Uh, that's the prominent thing. But there is another, I have to be honest with you, there is another part of my mind that today I did not have to drive up the New Jersey Turnpike and deal with New York traffic. And that is just a delight. So anyway, we're in, for me, we're in the best of both worlds. I sort of get to see you face to face and, and uh, I, didn't have to, I didn't have to weather the traffic to do it. I am I'm delighted to be able to think about this topic with you. Um, I've thought about it before, but I, my, what's my goal this evening is to grow. I, I would like to grow in learning from you and being able to think about this very important and, and, and challenging, challenging struggle. I would like to be able to say fewer unhelpful words because I know I can say unhelpful words to those who struggle with depression. I would like to be able to say more helpful words. I would like to grow in humility and compassion and be guided by the spirit and scripture more and more. So, so that's, that's a lot to ask of, of an hour and a half, but, but I, I want to grow. That's, that's, that's my prominent goal, and I suspect it's, it's your goal as well. The, the approach I want to take is, is sort of a chronological approach, if you will, uh, where we would follow the progression from meeting someone, talking to someone who's depressed, and sort of walk through what questions might we be having along the way, what, 
what do we do next? What do we do when we feel utterly lost in being able to help them? So, and, and if you have if you have an outline, it will give you some idea of, of where we're going. But hopefully, there'll be a kind of natural chronological movement to to our time. So here's where we always begin. We we invite the person to speak. We it. I, I suspect the phrase I use more than any other. It's not a technique. It just I don't have that many. I don't have that many more sophisticated questions. What's important? What is most important? What is on your heart? I I want to invite them to speak. I want to invite them to speak for for two reasons. One is I I I want to know them. I how how can we bring the biblical counseling? As Ellen was, was was talking about it, it's 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 knowing a person and bringing scripture to sort of to match the the, the wrestlings of that person's heart to 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 bring them as clearly and personally as possible. So to be able to bring scripture to bear to, to somebody's life together with them, we we need to understand what are the things that are most important on their soul. So, so I guess the first question I have is, is what have you heard when you have talked to, to people you know and love who struggle with depression? Or if you've been depressed yourself, what are in response to, what is it like? What's on your heart? Please, I, you know, I, I invite you, please, please speak. It's not really loud. The most important. Uh, let, me, let me read you a few things that, that um, that I've, I've had laying around for a while because I find them to be so helpful. I, I'm reading something by Spurgeon now. And Charles Spurgeon, as you know, was, was among those who came before us who spoke very publicly about their depression. It's, and, and the fact that he's an Englishman is probably significant. If he was an American, he would have been a little more reluctant to speak of it because I think there would have been a little bit more shame involved. In England, I think they, they tend to think there is probably more of a medical component to their depression. Here are some of the things that Spurgeon has said. You may be surrounded with all the comforts of life and yet be in, in wretchedness more gloomy than death itself if the spirits be depressed. You may have no outward cause whatever for sorrow and yet in the mind be dejected. The brightest sunshine won't relieve your gloom at such times you're vexed with cares, you're haunted with dreams, you're scared with thoughts that distract you, you fear that your sins are not pardoned, past transgressions are brought to remembrance and punishment is beating out, being meted out to you in full measure. That's a, that's a, very, that's a very brief paragraph, but I hope that you get the sense of being overwhelmed by it. If you're feeling overwhelmed by that paragraph and thinking, what is this and where do we even begin? Then you're beginning to get a little tiny taste of, of depression. He goes on, uh, it, it, was, it was something that occurred throughout his life. When he was younger, he said, my spirits were sunken so low, I could weep by the hour like a child and I didn't even know what I wept for. As he reflects on, well, how, how do you help? says this, he says, causeless depression. That's, that's the how he identifies depression. Depression is causeless. There might be causes, but he does not know what they are. You hear somebody who's thought long and hard about their own struggle. Causeless depression, it can't be reasoned with. David's, car, David's harp can't charm it away. We might as well fight with the mist as with this shapeless, undefinable, all be clouding hopelessness. Very vivid as Spurgeon tends to be. And notice this, the iron bolt, which so mysteriously fastens the door of hope and holds our spirits in gloomy prison, needs a heavenly hand to push it back. Other people, when they talk about depression, they, they talk about as if, as if something inside them, as if they died. It, 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 is their des, it feels like their desire is gone. Uh, J.B. Phillips, who, who is a Bible, Bible translator, uh, 
he wrote a book called The Price of Success. And it was a kind of autobiography, but frankly, the only reason he wrote it was to confess his depression because, because he hoped that if he would be able to speak about it, maybe others would, would come out and speak of it as well. He, he, it, it, he spoke of the death, illustrated the death in different ways. One way was he spoke of a, a love for music that he had. But when he was depressed, the music, it, it wasn't that he didn't love it anymore. It was that it was discordant. It, it just didn't sound right. And he wasn't even able to listen to it. To make matters worse, he remembered when he did love it. And, and that, that gap between the discordance that he heard and the affection that he once had, he, he, he could measure that in, as pain. He, he spoke about his own writing and he he felt like this, he says, the springs of creativity were suddenly dried up. Some of the words or images that you hear, emptiness, which raises the question, was anything taken from you? Has anything been taken from you? Your honor, whatever it might be. Uh, weighed down, people feel like they're, they just can't move as quickly. Everything seems to be slower. They're weighed down. So it raises the question, what, what is the burden? Could you describe the burden that you're carrying? For some people, it's darkness. And as you enter into darkness, blindness, wandering around, one of the key features of darkness would be fear. That's if you're, if you're suddenly blind, you are going to be incredibly vulnerable to the world around you, especially in that particular environment, uh, you were gonna be take advantage, taken advantage of. You, you would be lost. Um, I was driving, and last night I was with my grandkids and, and we just went over to a little playground. And on the way back, I said, did any of you know how to get home? And one of them volunteered to do directions. And he wasn't quite sure of one particular turn. And and so he went, he, he went, there are all kinds of ways we could have gone back to our house, but he took a turn, wasn't the right way. And you could see the, the incipient fear in his face that he was becoming lost. Now he knew I knew how to get home. So he was in good hands, but, but even there, that sense of, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how to get there. There was a, there was sort of this beginnings of terror that, that was, that was, that, that just sort of knocked on his door. So the a question with those who talk about darkness is, tell me of your fears. Other people, they simply speak of pain and, and this, this, this sort of all beclouding death, this experience of death, as if, as if all signs of life have left them, other than simple locomotion. They, they're walking around like, as if they are alive. We also have a, a quote in there by a, a writer named David Foster Wallace. David Foster, th this, this particular quote is about suicide. It's especially poignant because if you know this particular writer is a fairly young man, I can't remember how old he was exactly, but I suspect he was, he couldn't have been more than his early forties. He, he took his own life. It was well known that he'd struggled with sort of dark thoughts. I, 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 it might be worthwhile for me to read it. I'll try to read it quickly. It talks about suicide. The depressed person who tries to kill herself doesn't do so out of, quote, hopelessness, in the sense that, you know, the person is not sort of weighing, uh, is there purpose in life? And it's not a calculated kind of, kind of decision. The person in whom this invisible agony reaches a certain, uh, an endurable level, will kill herself the same way a trapped person will eventually jump from the window of a burning high rise. Make no mistake about people who leap from burning buildings. Their terror of falling from a great height is still just as great as it would be for me or you standing at the same window. The fear remains constant. The variable here, is the other terror, the fire's flames. When the flames get close enough, falling to death becomes slightly less terrible of two terrors. It's not that they desire the fall, it's the terror of the flames. 
And yet nobody down on the sidewalk looking up and yelling, don't, don't, hang on. And understand the jump, not really. You don't have to have been, you ha you'd have to have been personally trapped and felt flames to really understand the terror um, of that's, that's way beyond falling. We begin by trying to, to understand the experience of it. And we want our compassion to be aroused. It, hopefully, it, it, even these beginning words, they, they lead us into a humility. The more, it, with, with each passing word, there's a sense that I know less and less. I don't have any idea what, what to say. I don't have any idea where we can go. But, but you know this, uh, you could ask, are you able to pray? Are you able to pray these things? We'll come back again and hit this. Here's, here is one thing we know. Pour out your heart to the Lord. It is, it is much more difficult than it seems. You have to grow up to be like a child. And, and most, of them ha most of us haven't grown up to that point quite yet. Uh, and I think there are various reasons. I could give you many personal illustrations how, how I am unskilled with this. But, but we call out to the Lord. If the person's not able to pray, what do we do? We, we say, I'll pray for you. Perhaps we say, well, keep this in mind. Is, you think it would be possible this week to write or to speak words to the Lord? And here's why you would do it. Because even though he is, he is the only one who knows every nook and cranny of your heart, and he can speak about the death that you experience in your soul better than you will ever be able to speak of it. And he is moved with compassion to by, by the things that you experience. For some reason, in his home, he wants his people to talk with him. He values that we speak. And by the way, all of us have some sense of that. That's what relationships do. We, we don't just assume that we're known. We, we put words under the matters of our heart. Uh, and you know, one of the common questions in a relationship is, how was your day? If a dead person's day was especially hard, uh, we, would feel, we would feel betrayed if a person kept such things to themselves. It's not the way relationships work. And it's not the way relationships work because, because if there is good that emanates through our world, it's an expression of God's house and, and the generosity of God to, to everyone. So we begin by inviting someone to find words for, for what it is that they struggle with. As we do that, there's, there's a question that we have, and it's what's, what's happening? Why is this happening? It's, a, it's an inevitable question. In our, in our minds, we might be thinking, well, it's how, do, how can this kind of terror come into somebody's soul? Is it, is it from sin? Is it from their body? Is it from Satan? Is it directly from God? Is it mistreatment from other people? It could be all of those. It could be, it could be one of them. If we follow Spurgeon, what, he says, what Spurgeon says is it's causeless depression. In other words, it's better if you are an agnostic about it. It's better for you to be settled in and saying, I don't know why. I don't know why this person is struggling with depression. Now, if there is a warning in scripture uh, about this particular question, what's the cause? It, it would be this. You know, we would, frankly, we would first think uh, the, the, the warning would be, don't look for Satan under every rock. That's, you know, you know Satan gets blamed for too many things. Uh, we, we might think that, but no, what scripture says is don't look for sin as a cause for things that are hard in a person's life. Don't do that. Unless it's absolutely clear, you don't look for it. That's really the only warning with sin. And along with simply, you know, don't jump to conclusions that you don't understand. 
from the book of Job, here's, here's what sort of sets up our care for another person. We don't have to know why we're going through suffering. Uh, Job did not, and, and perhaps never understood why he was suffering. Uh, in, in some forms of help, if you don't know the cause, you're not gonna be able to help. But, but as children of God, there are ways that we can speak beautiful words of God, even without knowing the particular cause of somebody's depression. So, so you see that, that, that these twin themes of humility and compassion are, are sort of raining on us immediately. Humility, because there's so many things we don't understand here. Compassion, because what we do understand, it is horribly, horribly painful. And, and we, we are moved by, by what we hear. Maybe a few other thoughts that I might have under that question. Those are the major ones. Sm small, uh, a smaller one, um, smaller one. If, if I'm thinking of anything in particular, I'm thinking of the side effects of medication. Uh, if, if there is a cause out there, that would probably be the most prominent one. If you look at medication and take a look at the side effects of them, depression is inevitably among among the top 10 or 15 side effects possible from medication. So what do you do? That means you, you ask those things. Are you, have you talked to your physician about this? The other thing we know is that no matter what the cause, depression is a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual problem. Now, the, the question that, that we need to clarify, of course, immediately is what, what do we even mean by spiritual? Um, spiritual is certainly not limited to we have a problem with sin. If a person, went, in natural language, if a person has a spiritual problem, we think they're rebellious in some way. But, but perhaps a, a better way to understand spiritual problems, it is spiritual. It is, it is, it is something that only the spirit can do, that, that we need the spirit of, of, of Jesus himself. To, to be our helper in this. When, when you see, I'm using the word spiritual from scripture, the word spiritual in scripture, typically when you meet it, 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 it really should be capitalized. It's, it's from the spirit. That's, that's what it means. So I'm, I'm borrowing that same idea. All depression, all cancer, every single problem in human life is a spiritual problem. It might also be a medical problem, but but it is at least a spiritual problem, meaning that, that we need the spirit. It means that there, there are things that, that we must have that only God himself can, can give us. So we're listening, we get in a sense of what's happening. We are overwhelmed by what we hear. Uh, we pose a question about causes and we actually, we, we actually can say a good bit but it doesn't guide us to a particular cause. We're just a little bit more comfortable not knowing the cause of a depression. And then we consider, what is it that God says to people in abject misery? What does he say? Well, we've, we've already hit one of them. Pour, pour out your heart to me, Psalm 62, eight. Speak to me from your heart. What are the rules for that? The rules are we speak to him. Hosea, what is it? Hosea, Hosea 7, I think. It says that the sin of Israel was they cried on their beds rather than cried out to the Lord. That's the sin. If you cry out to the Lord, you, you, you are in the corpus of the Psalms. You're giving all kinds of freedom to, to speak your questions. Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far away from me? Don't you care? These are some of the questions that if we're not going to ask them, the Psalms ask them for us. The Psalms give us those words to actually ask. So speak to the Lord with, 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 um, with anything that is on your heart. That's, that's one thing we know. And that's something, obviously, it's, it's not a phase of, Talking to somebody who's depressed, it's a, it's a lifestyle. 
Other things we know, in the midst of suffering that seems unbearable, we cry out to our God who strengthens the weak. We pray for endurance or perseverance. Give you a few different passages to, you know, there are dozens of passages that we can look at there, but, but I've given you a few. One is in Hebrews. And, one, and the reason I like to go to Hebrews for perseverance is because Hebrews uses the word faith a little bit differently than Paul does. He includes Paul in, in his understanding of faith, faith being trust, surrender, um, leaning on, resting in another rather than ourselves. But, but Hebrews also adds this. By faith, Moses, this is Hebrews eleven twenty seven. By faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered by faith because he saw him who is invisible. He was able to see him who is invisible. That's for, for the writer of Hebrews, faith is seeing the things that are unseen. And we'll come back to that. But, but, but you, can see, you can see how a passage like that would, would, would if, you were t- if you were the one walking along with a depressed person, would guide you to, let's pray. Let's pray that we would see the one who's invisible. Um, it might guide you to reading scripture together. Let's pray in this scripture that we would see Jesus. We would see Jesus with eyes of faith. The spirit would open our eyes. These are some of the practical things that you're going to, to do. Romans 15, 4, what do we know? We know we're called to endurance and perseverance. We know that he promises to strengthen us in this way. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. How has that worked out in, in some of my own counseling this week? Uh, endurance through the encouragement of the scripture. Yeah, you know, it was it was a woman who who was fairly good at the piano, and she had she had an electric piano around, and 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 the, the lyrics of good worship music, coupled with the 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 music itself, tends to tends to strengthen her. Some one of the things that you the spirit uses to sort of press the word into her own heart. Some people will write out a kind of liturgy, a kind of confession of faith that 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 captures perhaps just one verse that the Spirit has has given them, so they possess it. Um, so, what do you know? What God says? We speak to the Lord. We we. We pursue his endurance and his perseverance. And then we, we keep our eyes open for comfort and we pray for comfort. A couple of scriptures that you have in front of you. I am the one who comforts you. The turning point of the book of Isaiah, and there's a lot of comfort words in Isaiah, and they, they turn on chapter 40. Because uh, chapter 40 is, it's, it's this, it's this clear sort of, sort of runway that aims for Isaiah 53. The gospel is clearly in view. Uh, the suffering servant is clearly in view. So it begins comfort, comfort these people who, who didn't know comfort. He is the God who seeks to comfort. He, he, he delights in comforting his people. As a mother comforts, so I will comfort you. Psalm 147.3, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Well, how does he comfort? We pray that, we pray that he would give life. I've, I've, come to, I've, I've come to give life and fullness of life. That's what the book of John says. Well, we pray. Lord, we want to see life. And, and, and it's going to be possible that, that we're going to miss it. So what, so what would life look like? Life would look like perhaps caring for another person. Life would look like for a depressed person actually praying for a grandchild or a neighbor. That's life. That is the evidence. You don't do that apart from the, ev- the, the, the spirit working in you. So, so when you're beginning to pray for comfort, 
it, it does put a certain responsibility on you. You want to see where that comfort comes because the person might miss it. And, and so as a result, when they, if you're praying with them and they pray for a friend, you stop and say, that's life. You don't feel life right now, but that is life. What we're looking for is the wind of the spirit going through your life. We're looking for things done by faith. We're looking for, for, for things that are spiritual, that are because of the spirit of Christ, that, that are not natural to us. And if comfort doesn't come, what do you do? You, you quote Psalm 119, when will comfort come? When will you comfort me? Perhaps you can ask at this point, what, what does comfort you? Has anything comforted you in the past? Uh, because when they're depressed, nothing is going to feel like it comforts them, but, but maybe something did before. Uh, and, and if you can duplicate that comfort, to walk with a friend, to read scripture, to read scripture with another person, um, uh, whatever it might be, uh, you perhaps should try to duplicate that. Now, now we could stop right there and, and we would we would have everything we needed to walk with that person for the rest of their lives, for the rest of our life. It, 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 it's, an, it's the nature of scripture. It's, we, we don't necessarily understand depression, but, but we understand that the Lord speaks to those who are, who are familiar with misery. And we don't have to know what the cause of that misery is. And he invites us to speak to him. He, we seek out the endurance that he gives and we seek out the comfort that he, he is committed to, to giving to his, his weak and overwhelmed saints. So we can stop right there. Uh, and, and the fact that we're, we can go on, and by the way, whenever we stop it, we'll just be dot, dot, dot. It will be et cetera, et cetera, and all kinds of other things we could say. Um, uh, scripture, what we're anticipating is scripture is a kind of treasure chest that always yields more. So let me just briefly move to some other things that are gonna cross our minds. One thing that will cross your mind is that, is that there are neighbors around you who have thought long and hard in depression, in psychiatry and psychotherapy. And here essentially is what they're saying, that, that to be helpful, the, 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 um, the standard of care for those at least in psychiatry, is medication and talk. Medication and talk. Not just medication alone, not just talk alone, but medication and talk. My, my interest now is not necessarily to, to dive into the specifics of that or to critique it. Um, it's just to know that that's what's out there and you know that and the person you're talking to will know that as well. And since they know that, they may well pursue medications. Um, but, but what I want you to see in particular is that it's the talk that, that is curious. It's not, and, and when, they, when, when it's the psychotherapy and medication, the professional community is not identifying any particular psychotherapy. There, is, there doesn't seem to be one that is, is necessarily better than the other. And the, the theory behind that is that what helps is two things. You have a person who cares. And the person is trying to help you assemble the pieces of a life that seems like it's, it, it's, it's no longer coherent anymore. There's no storyline to it. It's, it's dark. It's, it's blind. It's wandering. So those are some of the things that you recognize are going on around you. And, and um, whether they're going on, whether they're happening for that person or not, that's that's not necessarily the most important thing. So you continue to walk along with them. And as you do, your, your understanding of them deepens. You, you begin to see that this is something that you're not familiar with. You, many of you probably have experienced being despondent and you, maybe even the word depressed. But most of our depression, there's a agility to it. When our circumstances are better, we're not, not depressed anymore. Uh, when the circumstances are hard, we feel pretty low. But, but depression, as we're talking about it this evening, is, 
it doesn't have that kind of normal resilience. As Spurgeon says, it's unmovable, it's unyielding. It doesn't mean it doesn't fluctuate. It has a mind of its own, it can fluctuate a bit, but, but it doesn't seem to have any rhyme or reason. So we, we were brought into what this is like a little bit more. And we recognize how isolating it can be. The greater the pain, the more isolating something is. As we reflect a little bit more, I, as, I, as I try to use my own experience and sort of move into another person's life, I, I think of what would it be like to wake up in the morning and to feel dead? I don't know what I would do, but I get up in the morning because I want to get up. I, I get up in the morning because I'm a little bit hungry and I, I wouldn't mind getting something to eat. And there are things that I want to do. There, you know, there, there, there's, there's getting into scripture. There's taking a look at the Philadelphia Inquirer and seeing, seeing what the sports teams have done overnight. Um, and and there, there's just things that I want to do. I get out of bed because I want to. I desire to. My, I'm, I'm motivated to. What would it be like to wake up and feel absolutely nothing? Well, most of us would be sorely tempted to just stay in bed all day. Because our emotions, our passions, they drive us more than we realize. And without desire moving us along, um, life can feel pretty dead. Now that's not the end of the story. For us, what that does is it, is it, is it brings to the fore the question, okay, now what does it mean to live by faith? Uh, rather than live by our senses, live by our circumstances. What does it mean, rather than to live by what is visible and experienced, what does it mean to live because of the one who is invisible and who is not seen? So you can see that that, that sends out a, a trajectory that is a full lifetime trajectory. What does it mean to live by, walk by faith rather than by sight? But you see what, what we're doing is, we're, it, our understanding is deepening a bit. We're, we're, we're understanding what it's like to be that particular person. The other thing we might find is, is that oftentimes our, our emotions are, are emotionally, I mean, I'm sorry, our memory is emotionally organized. That, that right now, I can't think of anything hard in my life. You gave me a couple minutes, I, couldn't, I probably couldn't think of too many hard things. But but if I am in a hard event and I feel the hardness of it, I can remember thousands of hard things in my life. It's almost as if they're, they're stored emotionally, uh, that something is hard, that something, hard it, that something hard in our life is stored with all kinds of other things that are hard. If, if, there's, anything, if there's anything to that at all, then we can understand why people who are depressed, they can't. They can't imagine good. They can't imagine anything good. They can't imagine love. They, they, can't, they can't feel words that are true and beautiful. Uh, all they can feel are things that, that are, 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 are dead Sorry, and, and lifeless. So you see what I'm doing? I'm just saying that we, we have plenty to work with already, but there's more we could do. Uh, at some point, we're going to ask the person to tell the story. What happened? Uh, what, tell the story of depression. When did, it, when did it sort of sneak up on you? When did you see some of the, the early warnings of it? And what has been its, its course in your life? Um, to, to hear the story, and as you do, you might find either contributors to, your, to depression, and you don't know if it's a contributor or not. You don't know if it's in part a cause or not, but they're important all the same. Uh, you might find abuse, you might find cruelty and other kinds of injustices. You might find failure, you might find shame, you might find great loss, broken marriages, you might find regrets. And when you do, uh, what do you do? You, Perhaps you, you, here's the person's story. 
And there are all these, 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 these hard things that have happened to them and, and, and things they've done that have woven through the story of depression. And, and your job is what's important in all that? Well, the easy way to find out is you simply ask the person. Here are different things you said. You, thank you so much for, for offering that story. And, and in, in that story, it seems like there were some critical things. There was, there, there was mistreatment by a mother. There was, there was this sense of failure and shame. And, and there's this present guilt. Um, now, I'm, I might be missing it, but, but what do you, as you've heard you yourself tell this story, what, what comes out as being especially important? And then what do you do? You, you move into scripture on that. You move into scripture uh, of, of, of the Lord who, who <laughs> when we've been rejected by another, he, he pulls us close to himself and we identify as how we belong to him. He, he speaks of, of how he will make things right, that injustices, they, they will be judged. And, and, and the day is coming when all injustices will, will somehow be made right and injustice will prevail. As you, as you hear the story, you begin to hear more, more common dimensions of the human heart. Fears, and what are the common dimensions of the heart? Fear, shame, failure, guilt, anger. Those are some of them. You begin to hear these. And, and what do you do? You're not assuming that these are the cause of depression, but, but they are important. And what do you do? You, you consider them in scripture. I won't go through case studies with you right now, but but, um, but I, I, have in, I have encountered people where, where anger was, I think, a significant part of their depression. Their depression did not leave, but their, but their <clears throat> depression, it, 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 was, uh, it was lighter as they began to deal with anger. People who struggled with guilt, um, uh, I've, I've seen their depression lighten, sometimes their depression very dramatically leave as they've known something of forgiveness of sins and they've known something of their own legalism to think they need to pay God back for their sins. Talk to, to men, especially who struggled with failure and the shame associated with it. Those who have had fears that have persisted, those who, those who have suffered loss and, and the loss as it sort of matures in their own heart, it brings a kind of death. What do we do? We, we talk about fears. We talk about shame. We talk about guilt. And of course, one of the, one, our beacon here is the person of Christ and the gospel itself. The gospel itself is identified as good news. So that's, that's always our, our standard. Does it sound good to the person? And not too much is going to sound good, but it's a question we can still ask. Does this sound good in any way to you? Does it sound good in any way? And then off we go. We, we set off in this new way of living. Where rather than living by, out of our own desires, we do things because we want to do them. It doesn't mean everything we want to do is bad. I mean, our, many of our desires are good desires. They're godly desires. But when you don't have any desires, you... You have, to have, you have to have a different, different way of living. Walk by faith, not by sight. That's the 2 Corinthians 5 passage. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. I, I find myself going back to this often. Outwardly, we're wasting away. Inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. And we fix our eyes on what is, is unseen, not on what is seen. Because what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal and of great weight. So we could, we could perhaps ask the question, what do you see? As, 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 you, as you put on Christ, what do you see? Who do you see? What do you see? No, that's not what you see. Okay, what we see is, 
is identified in scripture. <laughs> so what, what, as you look through yourself, at yourself and your world through scripture, what is it that, that you see? And, and, in the, and, and the way of seeing is going to, is, is, is going to be helped by the rudiments of the Christian life. To be in scripture, scripture, whether we want to or not, I have some friends who use the expression force feeding, which, which means they, they don't know they're hungry for God's word, but they force feed themselves anyway. Uh, and and they're, they're obviously they're heroes of the faith. So, so how do we see? How do we see by faith? Well, we force feed. We pray that God would open our eyes. We ask other people what they see. It's, a, it's fair game. Person saying, okay, keep, keep asking me what I see. Well, what do you see? You know, what, do, what do you see by, by faith? Help me, please. Hebrews, Hebrews talks about faith as a kind of seeing. And one of the ways that Hebrews encourages us to be able to see is in Hebrews 10, it says, Let, let's hold fast to the confession of our hope. The confession, what is it that we truly believe or what do we see? Let's hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering because he, was, who, he who promised is faithful. And just to, I'll, I'll stop for, for, for you to embellish things and, and some of your questions and your observations. Um, let me, let me, and let me end with um, a psalm. Uh, the the psalm that, that seems to be the darkest of psalms is, is Psalm 88. Um, and sometimes with people who have struggled with depression, I, I'll go and look for little, little tiny pieces, little fragments of psalms, little words here and there that might capture some of their experience. Is it like this? Is it like this? Is it like you're in the lowest pit? Is it, is it, is it like you're in hell itself, where this, this utter de is devoid of, of life and Jesus seems far, far away? Um, does it feel like his wrath lays heavily on you, that the waves of pain just keep coming at you? What I'm doing, I'm just paraphrasing some things from Psalm 88. Um, but, but one of the things that we can do as we grow is we can we can hear some of these words of a psalm and, and we like the psalm. It, 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 it puts words into our own heart. And then that becomes an occasion to see more deeply. And then to see more deeply would mean at least this, that, that when we enter into the psalms, we are entering into the psalms of Jesus Christ. He is the divine singer. And, and he obviously he, Jesus quotes the Psalms so often. The, the Psalms are the very words of Jesus. And what he does is he says to his people, enter in. Enter into even my own suffering. Uh, enter into this community of, of sufferers. It's profoundly personal. And not only personal, it's, it, it, is, it is life. Death isolates Life draws people into a community, and we're in the very community of Jesus. And then perhaps we go back to Psalm 88 and see how even though it is, it is the darkest of psalms, it is, it, is, it is a very mature psalm, and it would be hard for us to make it our own. It begins this way. O oh Lord, the God who saves me, day and night I cry before you. In my prayer come before you, turn your ear to me. Now, now, immediately, we are in awe of anyone who could enter into this psalm. The psalm identifies the, the fragments of pain in a person's heart. But, but the beginning is, is this psalmist, this expert, the crying out to the Lord. And... There are very few things more beautiful than that. There are very few things that are evidence of greater strength than that. So going back to what I said earlier about how 
it's a whole lot harder to cry out to the Lord and speak honestly to him, to him from our hearts than we realize. So we, we, can, we can borrow a few words from Psalm 88, but, but to enter into the psalm of this psalm of Jesus and make it our own, to speak these words in unison with him, it's a tall order. Um, I call out to you, O Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. And then a series of questions. And then we walk with humility and compassion. Compassion says you're on my heart. Here's how I'm praying for you. How can I pray for you now? How can I, how can I encourage? Humility, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't walk in thinking we're the one who knows everything. We know where to turn. Uh, and, 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 and we know some of the basics of scripture. The Lord who calls us to cry out to him and gives us strength to persevere and have comforts. Um, but humility is, is what has been helpful during our conversations. What has been unhelpful in our conversations? When have you noticed a little spark of life in your soul? Um, and out of that humility, you, you continue to pray and walk along with the person. What we've just done is, is, a, is, is a very sketchy map, granted. But, um, but it, is, it, is, it is bringing life to a person who feels death. And in every step of the way, it's been, it's been deeply spiritual. Where the things we're doing is because of the spirit, not because of our own cleverness. It's, it's, uh, it comes out of our own dependence on scripture. And, and it's a blessing to, to those who walk along with you. And we keep growing. Wise people want to keep growing. We keep learning. We ask other people what they're learning. We read things. We keep learning. We continue to pray. We learn from other people who are depressed and, and hope to be able to serve the body of Christ with greater and greater wisdom and love. I'll stop there. Uh, obviously, it leads lots of holes in, in the discussion, but um, I'll let your observations and questions fill up some of those holes. Well, thank you, Dr. Welsh. You've given us a lot to think about tonight. We appreciate uh, all your insight and, and all that God has shown you, and praise the Lord for that. We're going to transition to a Q&A time uh, for a few more minutes. Uh, so be thinking about those questions. If some people are, are um, uh, love to talk on camera like this, and so you're welcome to unmute yourself in just a moment and ask. If you're a little shy, you can put those in the chat, and I'll be happy to answer. The, you know, ask them for you. Um, but uh, I want to just share before that, as you as you think about and process and and, and formulate your questions. Um, we have a, a seminar coming up, a workshop coming up in September with uh, author Elise Fitzpatrick. Uh, it's gonna, again, a one hour online workshop entitled Get Free from the Fear, from Fear, Worry and Anxiety. Um, and I'll put uh, that link in, in the chat tonight if you want to. Actually, I'll put it in there, but it's really easy. It's www.southbaychurchli.org, our, our website for our church slash fear. And um, you can log in, you can sign up for that. Also, it works the exact same way as this one. And I hope you all received your book, uh, Dr. Welsh's book on depression. Uh, that's our gift to you. We, we bought them for each one of the, uh, as just as, as a, yep, there you go, Ellen. Thank you for that. Um, and also, I'd like to ask you to do me a favor for tonight um, uh, as, we, as we wrap up tonight. Uh, before we close in prayer and, and do the q and in just a moment, uh, at 8.15, you're going to receive a uh, evaluation. We like to improve things at our church. Uh, so you're going to receive an evaluation form. It'll literally, literally take you less than a minute. It's just click, 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 and it'll take you. But we uh, just less than a minute. We just ask you to take time to fill that out. So Ellen has already unmuted her, herself. I knew she would have a question. So Ellen, why don't you start us out, and uh, after that, you can be you know, free to follow whoever would like to go after. I sure will, and thank you so much. And Dr. Welch, um, wow, 
I loved what you said about um, this is spiritual and, and we need spiritual help in this because that's, that's just, it's, it's, it only the spirit can do this work. Um, and I think people here who are suffering from depression, people here who are helping someone who is suffering depression can oftentimes have the desire that they would snap out of it, that we would say that thing to them that would make them just snap out of it, that they would just, and what seems to be more the case is people tend to cycle in and out of it. It can get, it can get worse. It can get lesser, but nobody seems to, in a finger snap, just pull out of it. My question is, how do you help someone who's living in the absolutes of, um, my life is always gonna be like this, it's never going to get better, and, uh, and I can't, I just can't. Uh, give you, I'll give you a few answers to that. Sometimes I won't say anything because, because they're, they're identifying sort of that deadness of soul where, where the idea of the idea of opening their Bible seems utterly impossible. Physically, viscerally, it seems, it seems impossible. So, so I might not do anything. Uh, and, and I think as a general rule, if we don't know what to say, to not say much is, is, is really a wise way to go. And so, so we pray. Um, how would I pray for that person? I would, I would pray, Jesus, have mercy. Jesus, have mercy on our souls. Have mercy on our souls. And, and, and then I might, the different things we've talked about, what is it that God says? I, I might go back to some of the rudiments. Uh, and, okay, well, you don't have to try. You don't have to try. In fact, one of the, one of the things that God says is just sit there and relax. In other words, rest. <laughs> you can rest because of him. Because, because, because Christ has done it. Amen. So you sit back and rest. And, and I'll just read you some of the things I read in devotions this morning. I'll just read them. Or, or maybe you could even read some of it. We'll read it together. And, and we'll stop at places that are perplexing. Or stop at places that seem like they could have little tiny sparks of light and life in them. Those are, I'm just, Ellen, I'm just giving you a few thoughts. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can see I'm leaning toward, 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 um, toward compassion and, and I'm leaning toward humility. I don't know what to do, but if we really understood them, we would, we would say, yeah, I, I I'm, I'm right with you. I'm right with you. It, it, all, all of life feels like you can't do it. All mm -hmm. of life. Right. who's got our next question tonight don't be bashful you have to unmute yourself or post it in the chat uh, so mercedes uh, dr welch she uh, said in the chat it may be a deficiency in nutrients do you want to speak to that at all and yeah it, it's the, the, best, the, the best answer is Spurgeon's answer. We don't know why, why people are depressed. Sure. Um, and, and it's similar to, you know, you know you're, some of you are familiar with the idea of schizophrenia and the research in schizophrenia sometimes calls it the schizophrenias. In other words, they, you know, there might be hallucinations and delusions and, and paranoia in the midst of it. But it can be all. It can be for all kinds of different reasons, and there are all kinds of versions of it. In that sense, I think we can probably say the depressions that there yeah. are. 
all kinds of reasons. And, and typically there's not gonna be one reason that is the answer. Typically we will not find that. Um, uh, typically there will not be a medical answer that is the answer. Now for, for one out of every, I don't know, one out of every 50 people, they take medication and voila, it, 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 it's, it's the answer in that it really does alleviate the pain and the darkness of depression. Uh, so so I, I've seen that and I suspect, I suspect many of you have seen that as well. Um, uh, for other people, it's going to be somewhat helpful. It's going to be more helpful than not taking it. Um, so, so could it be could it be nutritional problems? Could it be thyroid problems? Could it be a hundred different medical problems that we don't are not familiar with yet? Could it be could it be genetic? Which you know it, it can be all kinds of things like that. The and and what do we do? We we can encourage encourage the person to pursue them, but you see, what we can use this as a as a kind of um, evaluation for ourselves. If we're talking more about nutrition than we are about matters that are more profoundly spiritual, not that the body is irrelevant, and not that nutrition is irrelevant. I'm just thinking. The Second Corinthians four passage: the body wastes away, and it's filled with weaknesses. But the but the inner person can be renewed day by day. Amen. Uh, if if we are if we are speaking about all kinds of medical treatments, uh, to the point where it's that becomes the weight of our time with someone, we're missing the greatest of treasures that we can give to them. Uh, so so all of us are going to have some ideas of things that might be helpful. Uh, and if you can feel free to recommend them. Yeah. And, and then, we, then we use the opportunity to, to speak of and give them the, the greatest of gifts. Speaking of that, Dr. Welsh, um, Greta put a question in the chat. Do you, how do you help someone who believes in God but may not have a relationship with Christ? Uh, I... I think two things, uh, you know, I'm thinking two things when, if the person says that. One is that most depressed people don't feel like they have a relationship with Christ. That's, that's part of depression. It's, you feel isolated and, 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 you, and, and you, can't, you can't experience things that are good. It's, it's as if you just don't have that capacity. So, so if a person has a profession of faith, they, it, it, it is, the, the likelihood is that they will feel like God has abandoned them. And as Spurgeon says, since guilt is, tends to be part of it, they'll, they'll, they'll believe God has abandoned them for really good reasons. Um, so if they were a believer, they're not a believer now. Um, and if there's, if there's eternal security, well, yeah, there, there are exceptions to the rule. Uh, so, so, so I would suggest that, that most of the people we speak to who have any profession of faith, they, they are thinking those things, that God has abandoned me, God has, God has left, I couldn't, I couldn't be a Christian. Um, and, and, and it would make sense too, because they go, if they go to church, if they go to church, if they're able to actually drag themselves into church, they look around during a worship time and they see people, they're, they seem happy and they seem lively and, and they're, they're singing with gusto. Meanwhile, they, they feel like they can't even stand up. You're not going to feel like you're part of it. You don't feel, you don't feel like if that's, if that's what God's people look like, then you're not one of them. Well, you know, what do I, what do I do? What was it? I might, I might miss the, 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 um, the reference, but what John six thirty seven or so that, that those who come to him, he will never turn away. Those who come to him, he will never, ever turn away. And there have been some really nasty kings, really, really loathsome kings, Old Testament kings who turned to him and he didn't turn them away. Um, uh, along with murderers and adulterers and all kinds of other things. You know, the, uh, God graciously sort of scatters scripture with people who are really, really bad. And, 
and he, he brings them to himself. So it's hard for us to say, well, I've been worse than, than those. So if a person feels like God has turned away from them, then, then live, walk, we're going to walk by faith. We're going to walk by faith. Okay. And, and by the way, this, a preamble like this might be important. We're going to walk by faith. What you feel is going to tell you all kinds of things. It's going to tell you not only has God abandoned you, but your spouse has no reason to be with you. And they should be abandoning you well, and your children hate you, and on and on and on. That's what depression is going to tell you if it, if it lasts long enough. It persists in an unceasing way. But, okay, now we're going to listen by faith. And I'm listening by faith. And perhaps to listen by faith, you might need to confess that you don't believe what God says. You believe depression more than you believe God. Uh, you, you see what I'm doing. I, I want this to be immensely good news. And, and so I'm not, I'm not suggesting for a moment that they, that they need to repent. And that's the reason why they're depressed. They're, I don't know why they're depressed. But to have eyes of faith, it, we turn away from living by sight and sensory experience. So, so we pray. We pray, Lord. They're, there are probably places where all of us are saying it couldn't be true. It couldn't be true because we can't imagine it being true. Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see. They, these are the words of the one who never, ever lies. He is the truth himself. And this is what the truth says, that those who turn to him, he will never turn them away. He will never turn them away. Here's what the truth says, that that his commitment, his desire from all eternity has been to be close to his people. That's been his desire. And if you think your miserableness somehow can interfere with God's desire to be close to his people, then you don't understand who God is. You do not understand the cross of Christ because the cross of Christ is a righteousness that has come from Jesus. And as Peter says, uh, to bring us to God. To bring us to God. That is, that's the extent to which God is willing to love us. Uh, he's, will, he's willing to go to death itself as a way to bring us to himself. So you, you see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, uh, I, 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 I'm not just saying, well, no, here, here's, here's the truth. I'm, 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 trying to, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to market the truth. Uh, I'm trying to market the truth in the Proverbs kind of way. When, when, when the author of Proverbs, when the, when the king in Proverbs is speaking to the princes and princesses, he's saying, okay, I'm going to tell you something that is really, really good, but it's not going to sound good. It might not seem like the way of life right away, but you, you can say Proverbs is interested in persuasion, and that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to persuade a person to be able to listen to, to the truth. I'm sorry, I went a little bit farther on that, but that's that's a, that's a really a very important question. These are all important. Absolutely. Dr. Welch, uh, Kevin asked a question. He said, uh, do you ever refer someone to a doctor for medication? If so, when and or why? Uh, um, Kevin, I, I, I can't impose my experience on you. Uh, everybody, I, everybody I see, they're already taking medication. And, and, and and I can remember 30, 40 years ago, I, I, you know, three, maybe three times a year, somebody would ask, should I take medication? Um, and I think my party line was, let's get together. Because once you, once you start taking medication, it's sort of, you, you sort of stay in that system for a while and it's hard to get out of it. Um, and, and medication can have its advantages and sometimes its disadvantages. Let's get together and please tell me the story and let's see if there are Let's see if there are trajectories that, that we see that are, that are good ones. Um, so sometimes I would say that, but everybody's already taking medication. So I, I, I just don't, I don't even raise the issue of medication anymore. And, and frankly, most of the people I'm, I see as a counselor, they're already taking medication. And I'm not even sure what medication they're taking. Um, uh, I, figured, I figured that's not my bailiwick. <laughs> I'll leave that to other people. Um, uh, and if I, I think it's prudent for them to, to talk to body people, uh, I think that's prudent. And from nutrition to 
to some kinds of physical exams to what are the side effects of the present medication they're taking to considering medication. Um, I wanna be very careful in, in, in what I say now. Um, I think there is anything, if we have compassion, anything that alleviates suffering that is legal, we're, as a general rule, we're all in, we're all for that. But we are offering something more important that, that if there's an alleviation of suffering, there will be other suffering. Uh, we, we know that. We are, at, we, are, we are talking about things that enlarge the soul, that bring life to the soul, that have eternal consequences. Um, so, so I'm not trying, in saying that, I'm not trying to diminish the, 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 the different knowledgeable people, especially physically knowledgeable, who can, who can participate in the person's care. Um, you can see in talking about them, if a person asks me that question now, if they would ask me the question, it says it's a good question. It's a tough one. I don't even I don't, I don't know what to say. Um, why don't you talk? Why don't you talk to a psychiatrist? Why don't you talk? Why don't you start by talking to your family physician about it and see what they think? I, I rarely even give my opinion these days on, on on those things because I'm because because I'm offering something better, and that's 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 I'd rather. I'd rather spend my time praying with the person than, than uh, talking about um, you know, for 15 minutes what the strengths and weaknesses of antidepressant medication. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Valerie uh, has a question and she's gonna ask it herself. Great. Hi everybody, thank you for inviting me tonight. And um, I have a question for Ed. Um, I know that I turned, there's only one scripture, one, one, actually a lot of scriptures, but basically this is my favorite Psalm. Um, I turn to whenever I, um, for some reason it calms me right down. Valerie, could I interrupt you before you go on? Cause I, cause what you're saying, I, I love what you're saying. Um, uh, one of the ways we can pray for those we care for who are depressed is is that the spirit would give them one passage that, makes, that, that, that becomes their own. You know, just one passage, just one passage. And, and that's, that, that's sort of an expression of that, that the, the, the desire to see comfort. If he comforts, he's the, it's the word that gives comfort. And, and, and just like what you're gonna say, all the, you're, you're not disavowing the goodness of the rest of scripture, but you were saying that the spirit has given you one thing that has been a unique gift. So I'm sorry, go ahead. So what you're saying is really relevant for our care for other people. But go ahead, say a little and bit more. Ask you what your favorite thing is to go to. Oh, oh, that's, oh. oh. <laughs> that's, I, that's a good question. I just like to make light. Of, I don't know, light of things. I thought I'd change it up. <laughs> yeah. Do I do I have a go to passage? I I don't. If if you were to ask me that, if, you, if, if you're struggling with depression and you were to ask me that, I would, what would I do? I'd tell you my passage from the week. I don't, I don't, I don't have a life verse, um, I, 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 but I do tend to have week verses or month verses. Um, mm -hmm. And let's see, Psalm 121 might be a week verse where here's, Here's who our God is. He is, close your eyes, look, look at him with eyes of faith. Jesus is the one who is next to us, so close to us that he, he blocks the noonday desert sun and he casts a shade on our right side. That's, that's what we see by faith. It's just, it's just one, of the, the, I, 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 it's, it's one of the images from, from Psalm 121 that captured me. And, and I suspect it captured me because, because um, a little while ago, I was at a, one of our grandkids' soccer games. And we were on the sideline that had the sun coming at us. And, and my youngest grandchild, uh, who's five, was, was with me. And she was squinting. You know, it was hard for her to see the game. And it was, you could just see it was uncomfortable for her. Well, I am, I, I am one of the, the whitest persons in history 
uh, and I, I think I, I'm not albino, but I, I'm just right next door to it. So I, I invest in the biggest hats I can have. My children are always embarrassed whenever we go to the beach together, but they've learned. <laughs> so I, I had this big old hat on and, and I, I said, I, I said, sweetie, come over here. And I was sitting in a little beach chair and uh, I, I brought her in. I, I sort of tucked her in until she was all under the shade of the hat. And what was striking to me was with this big old hat, she had to be really, really close. The nice thing for me was that she loved it. She, she, she didn't mind me, but she found a place where she could be in the shade and see her brothers <laughs> play soccer. Um, so I, I think that particular experience, the spirit used it to set me up to hear Psalm 121. Yeah. So, so um, and, and, and sometimes that's what I'll do with those who are struggling with depression. Uh, I, 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 I would like to be able to read scripture with them persistently I, mean, I, I, I would like to have some time reading scripture together with them because to create, to create some kind of imagery you know well it, it, anything to uh, th these are the words of life and the person the person feels like it's death and where else can we go and and uh, oftentimes i'll if i don't know where to go i'll just read read the things that i had for my devotions where i'll read my my psalm of the my psalm of the week thank you Sorry. Just one quick note on Psalm 121. I love Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. I just love their worship. Um, they sing a song called My Help. You should Google that. Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, My Help. They sing Psalm 121, and it's fantastic. So I'm just giving Thanks. that as a free, free little snippet. Thanks. Hey, Monica. Which, which would, by the way, Martin, you're, you're raising other creative ways to... to, to um, to encourage the heart of a depressed person if if somebody if somebody was going if, if i'm getting together with somebody and they're going to pray play psalm 21 by the brooklyn tabernacle choir my heart's going to be blessed for at least one reason one is you wanted to re you really thought hard to try to bless me <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah you, you 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 got it set up on your your iphone whatever it might be you really you really thought about me and 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 love Love doesn't seem like seem like it gets through depression, but it does. <laughs> it does. A uh, human being can still recognize love no matter how depressed. The other thing is that you're you're offering me something from scripture, and it might it might be a one it might be the one that captures me. So so thanks. So uh, I'm going to ask you one more question, but I just want to recognize a special guest tonight. Look at Vic, who's sitting on Victoria's lap. We got a, a special guest with us tonight. Woohoo! Babies have to lift depression, I think. So I love it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you, you, well, you know what you're saying. They, they, they lift it and they cause it, but they more often <laughs> cause it. Uh, so I'm thinking of yeah, I mean, one of the one of the kinds of depression that that we we can track down is postpartum depression, yes. where it, it's much more frequent than we think, um, and it tends to have a relatively short half life, yeah. but not always but not always. So, so um, yeah, you know, maybe I'll say a little bit more about that. People used to think there's something unique to childbirth, but, but when you follow people who've gone through significant surgeries, it will be the same thing. They just don't, they, they don't call it postpartum depression, but there is a kind of post-surgical experience that, that, is, that is fairly frequent um, that mimics postpartum depression. Dr. Welsh, Monica asked a question um, tonight, was very helpful to me, but what more can I do for my spouse who I think is currently depressed? I pray and have asked him if he needs help with anything. He doesn't sleep well, has gained lots of weight due to COVID-19, and has very little interest in doing anything. Yeah, that's... I'm pausing because it's such an important question, and and um, it's a question that that I've heard a number of times recently. My my first thought is I don't know, which is another way of saying anything I'm going to say after this. It's please don't think of it as thus saith the Lord. There are, there are things that I think are biblically informed, but they may not be relevant to you and, and to your husband. 
Um, well, here's what we know that that life, what are the means of grace? That would be another way to put it. The means of grace, the means of life to our bones. It's, it's the word, it's prayer. It's the Lord's supper. It's the fellowship of being with God's people. Uh, so what might that mean? It might mean, all right, I am gonna, I'm going to turn the TV off right now. And I'm going to read my devotions to you. And hate me if you will, for getting in your way. Uh, but if you hate me, you have to tell me why, because I'm not going to take it personally. But I'm going to I'm going to read scripture to you, or another version of that. I'm going to turn the TV off right now, and and I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray number six for you, because because in the New Testament we're all priests. <laughs> Uh, that's that, that, that's how the Old Testament puts it. That all of God's people will someday be priests, and not just the not just the Aaronic line or the Levitical line. Uh, so go ahead, be a priest. Read Numbers chapter six. Read the benediction of Numbers chapter six, and lay hands on your husband, and and then do it again tomorrow, and do it again the next day. You, you see what I'm saying? I I don't know, and, but. But, but the fine thing about being a Christian is we just don't have to know. We don't have to be smart. We don't have to have all these dramatic insights. We don't have to, be, we don't have, to have more insights than the rest of the world. We, we just have to be children who know the things that are obvious in Scripture. And so it, I, this is what I'm doing. I'm just talking about things that I'm giving a sample of things that are obvious in Scripture. And there might be, we, we might have to brainstorm for, you know, for, you know, go through 20 more items before something sort of clicks to that person. But you can see the genre is, is what are really basic things that, that we know that, that speak life to another person. Praise the Lord. I, I want to uh, probably wrap it up now. There's no more questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Welch, for uh, sharing your insight. We've had many people in the chat just tell us how uh, much they've learned tonight and how helpful it was. So we just appreciate that. It was a pleasure to host all of you. Um, so uh, if we can assist you or if you want to go further with biblical counseling, you're local or we can do this via Zoom. We do do some, some Zoom counseling. That's not our favorite, but we, we can certainly help with that. Um, but if you're local, we'd love to see you come to church, come to the counseling center, get help, and we would we would it would be our pleasure to assist you. Uh, let's close in prayer, and we will be posting this online um, with some other resources. We've written blogs and other resources. That we'll post links to uh, Dr. Welsh's books also if you need any of those. Uh, so we'll send that. It's going to take us a couple of days to get that page together, and then we will send that off to you. So let's have a word of prayer. God, thank you, thank you, thank you for Dr. Welch. Thank you for his ministry. Thank you for your, his blessing, uh, Lord, that he has bestowed upon us tonight. Father, we lift up everyone in attendance and, and just pray that, Lord, whether they were here because they, they love somebody that's suffering in this darkness, or Lord, maybe they are here as a, re, as a result of the stubborn darkness. And that is such a great uh, descriptive word of, of what, it is felt so often, um, that stubborn darkness that just seems to cling to us that we can't break free from. But Lord, through Christ, we know that you are able to do all things. And, and Lord, we, in Jesus' name, lift up everyone who attended, whether they're here for a loved one or whether they're going through this in person, that by your spirit, Lord, you would break through through the, the stubborn darkness and let the light of your gospel, let the light of your your son Jesus shine through that and uh, that darkness, Lord, your light can pierce any darkness. It just flees instantly. And Lord, we pray in Jesus name that you would breathe a new life, fresh life from your word into every heart and let it birth uh, joy, Lord, unspeakable and full of glory and, 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 and settle upon them freedom, Lord, that can only come from Jesus we pray for that in Jesus' name. We praise you for tonight's session, Lord. And we just pray that this would be the beginning for some that came. And, and Lord, that you would you would literally do a miracle in every heart in life. And Lord, we will give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
you so much for joining everybody. No one, thank you so much for thank inviting me to you. join your community. It's so Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Everyone have a good night. Good night. God bless.